All right, you guys, I know that was kind of a weird safety meeting, but I just wanted you to know, that's why I always wear Weld with my shirt off, because it gives you a really good tan, especially in winter time. It's, it's, we're, all of us are pretty pasty right now, especially you. All right, well, that's all I wanted you to know. Work on that next time. Okay. And then, oh, are you, you're ready to fill in the intro. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so this is video number four in the series. We've had three before. If you missed those, get back and watch them because we got lots of good stuff in there. In this video, what we're gonna be doing is we will show you the final assembly on the third member, prep for the housing's final assembly, and then we will jump into the good stuff, the chassis assembly, the final chassis assembly. So, let's get to it. Hey, get back to work, you guys. What are you guys doing here? What? Safety meeting is over. My goodness. Picking up where we left off in the last episode, we begin by bolting the third member case to our setup fixture and remove the carrier caps. Next we set the ARB air locker in the lightly oiled saddles and installed the bearing caps and spanners. We made sure to shift the ring gear to the left so the pinion could be easily installed and the bolts torque per spec. Then we set the carrier bearing preload and marked the spanners with a paint pen. After that, we installed the pinion, starting with an estimated 30 thousandths of shims and shifted the ring gear to the recommended backlash. The marked spanners allowed for moving the carrier while maintaining the bearing preload. With the bearing preload and ring gear backlash established, the ring gear pattern was checked using gear marking compound and our proprietary tooling which spins the gears at highway speeds. Once we obtained the desired pattern, we installed the spanner locks and torqued down all the bolts for the last time. The last detail in our assembly was the ARB airline, which had to be routed, cut, then installed into the compression fitting that was pre-installed in the case. Using a valve and pressure gauge, we applied 90 PSI to the locker and let it sit for an hour or so to check for leaks. The airline held just fine and we moved on to the second third member assembly. The next step was pre-assembling the two housings, which takes place before installing them under the chassis. This involved installing the inner seals and the freshly assembled dropouts. Now on for the fun part, the chassis assembly. We began assembling the control arms by running a tap in the threaded holes and installing the Johnny joints with anti-seize compound. With the newly powder coated chassis on the lift, we installed the assembled control arms to the chassis mounts and the front and rear housings. During the fabrication phase, we intentionally shimmed the Johnny joint centers to the brackets with an extra 20 thousandths of space anticipating the buildup of the powder coating. This allowed for seamless assembly at this stage of the game. It's a real poke in the eye if you don't build in the extra space. The next step is installing the Fox Factory Race Series 2.5 coilovers and bump stops. 
We had choices on brands, but we chose Fox Racing because of their superior engineering, reputation, and customer feedback. Now that the front and rear ends were placed with the control arms and coilovers, we proceeded with the final assembly. The rear end assembly involved installing the outer seals, unit bearings, axle shafts, and the brakes. The 35 spline axle shafts are, of course, machined from our own Dutchman brand of upgraded high tough material, which is between Chromoly and 300M in strength. Next part's splining, right? Or what? I'm not supposed to know that. Uh, uh, Listen, go away. You can't watch this next part. Okay. It's a secret. Okay. Stop. Uh, um, stop falling. I'm not. Oh. Regarding the brakes, our brand of choice was Willwood, for the same reason as the Fox coilovers. The rear braking system includes Willwood's big 14-inch rotors, Aero 4 four-piston rear calipers, and our own CAD design for a Tahoe-based internal park brake system mounted on a billet backing plate. The front end assembly involved installing the outer seals, knuckles, unit bearings, axle shafts, Dynatrack locking hubs and the Willwood brakes. The front axle shafts are, of course, our own Dutchman brand, machined from chromoly material, the same material that you would get when buying custom axles from us. The front braking system includes Willwood's big 14 inch rotors, Aero 6 six piston front calipers, and our own CAD design bolt on billet caliper bracket. Assembly involved machining the knuckles so the bracket would sandwich between the spider tracks knuckle and unit bearing and serve as a caliper mount for the massive Willwood six piston calipers. In order for the rotor hats to fit the gigantic F350 unit bearing hubs and 5.8 studs, we had to drill out the stud holes and bore the center register to fit. Once finished, we installed the rotors and bolted up the calipers. Next up was the custom fabricated stainless brake lines. When doing a custom build, the way you route the hard lines and flex lines depends on a variety of factors. We went with the most logical route by running the hard lines to the front and rear upper control arms, then use short flex lines to jump onto the control arms. Hard lines were then used for the length of the control arms. At the other end, we again used short flex lines to bridge onto the housings. Now that the flex lines were on the rear housing, we use hard lines all the way up to the calipers. As for the front housing hard lines, we ran them as far as we could, then switched to flex lines to connect to the calipers to allow for the steering rotation. Anytime you're fabricating this type of brake line system on a long arm suspension setup, you need to keep the flex lines as short as possible to minimize brake pressure losses, aka a soft pedal. With all the brake lines all finished up, we bolted on the modified steering box. The Maxxis Razor 40 inch tires are beautifully paired with two-piece forged wheels 
from Fuel Off-Road. This compelling combination is impressive, both in looks and function. And now for the engine and tranny installation. There are a slew of options when it comes to doing an engine swap for more power. For us, the natural pick was the ever-popular GM LS V8. Instead of a car LS, we chose a late model 6.2 truck and SUV LS, like what you'd find in a Denali or Escalade. The reason? Well, they make higher torque at a lower RPM than the car LS engine, they are easy to work on and tune, and they are very dependable. Plus, they have crazy amounts of aftermarket support if you want to make more power. For the tranny, we chose a matching GM 6-speed automatic because of the deep first gear ratio, which is good for crawling, and overdrive in sixth, which is good for highway travel. All right, everybody, thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to leave a like down below and comment on the video if you have any questions about the Jeep build. Also, in the next one, we will be finishing up the chassis assembly, so stay tuned for that, turn on your notifications, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. As for me, I gotta get back to work, so I'm headed to the weld shop.